Great. Um, yeah, thank you for coming in person. You're the fighters. Um, this is a special lecture. I really always enjoy this lecture. Um, we prepare it many weeks in advance, this lecture. Um, this is with the TAs. Um, we go through many process, many uh, steps of selecting papers. Um, and then each TA prepares uh, lectures for two uh, papers and present what are the latest in the last two years, the papers that we've seen um, that may help for some of your research or just in general to know about it. So this is today. Um, on uh, Thursday, uh, on Thursday, what we will have, oops, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, on, on Thursday, what will we have is uh, uh, our last uh, lecture, which is on a quantitative, quantifying, uh, understanding under the box, interpretable, interpretation, sorry. And then there's no lectures the Tuesday of Thanksgiving. We want you to work on your project um, and, and also take some time off with your family uh, if, or friends uh, during Thanksgiving. Um, and then after that, we have two amazing uh, speakers, uh, guest lectures uh, coming, uh, Moed Benzel and uh, Mohamed uh, from Cost. Uh, who did uh, G mini GPT-4 and many other projects. Like very, very excited uh, to have both of them. Uh, some of them will be waking up uh, West Coast. Uh, Jack also woke up West Coast. So it's three hours later, earlier, just to give you a lecture. So really appreciated their time. Um, reminder, uh, this, is, this week is the last reading assignment. Uh, so many last things. Um, so last reading assignment. This is like, in a sense, this is the most, the easiest and the hardest to select because at this point we, we've we learned so much. We we like whatever the, the nice, interesting papers, but we also focus a lot on topics that are related to the lecture on Thursday on quantification. So that's the papers for this week. Um, as you remember, the final, so there's two big milestones remaining final report due on Sunday. Uh, this is N minus one research ideas, and you need to have N minus one research ideas in your report. Now, you could put a little bit more emphasis on one idea and a little bit less on others, but we need to have the description of the idea, experiment compared with some baseline, and a discussion. Those three items have to be there for all three research ideas. There's just no way for us to give you full grade if we don't see that for all three of them. Discussion is important. Discussion of the error, like why is it performing well? Why is it not performing well? And as a reminder, better performance over the baseline gave you no extra point. This is not how we grade, but as long as you understand why it's working or why it's not working, or at least as an intuition, qualitative or quantitative, uh, that's the goal. Then the final poster presentation, we are quite likely to open it up to the general public. So there it's one poster per team. And because it's only one poster, we suggest to focus on one research idea. You can do all research ideas on the poster, but we found that to make it easier for the people, you focus on one, maybe two research ideas and present them. But we still want all team members involved in the creation of the poster and at the presentation. We can't have just one person saying the same way we, you did so well for the presentation, oral presentation, the same thing is needed for the poster presentation. And um, if you didn't have enough multimodal, really exciting, uh, we have advanced multimodal course. Um, uh, I can say for sure it will be in the spring given. I cannot promise it will be given in two years. Uh, Paul is graduating. We'll have to decide how this course goes. But if you want advanced multimodal, it's a reading group uh, based. It's mostly one day a week where you have to come and you discuss the paper. You've read them in advance. It's really fun. We, we pick the brand new 
topic and then really go in depth. What should we expect of foundational uh, foundational model? Are they like where do what do they perform well? What they don't? I like, really understand and discuss this. It's a small group. I usually try to keep only like 15, 16 students uh, to those discussion. It's really fun. It, uh, optionally, this uh, six credit course can become a 12 credit course. Uh, and there you're going to meet twice a week. So once for the reading group and once uh, with the uh, mentor, me and Paul, um, on a research project. It's mostly kind of an independent study with uh, the reading group all together. Um, I was going to also, if you have friends who have not taken 777, it is also offered in the spring. And I just confirmed to Jonathan that I will help him on some of the lecture. Jonathan is taking the lead, but I would co-lecture some of the uh, lectures with him. Um, and last thing, uh, if you would like to be a TA for the class, uh, this is a, a great occasion. So if you want to be a TA uh, for 777, uh, I think we're looking for, well, we got one or two uh, TAs. There may be two or three more uh, spot available. Um, contact me and or Jonathan for 777. It's really interesting. What we're looking for is TAs who are research oriented. As you've seen, your primary TAs are meeting with you, helping, that's the core. Yes, there's also some grading. Eh, you can't be a TA without some grading, but a big part of it, and that's how we select it, is your uh, experience and interest in research. Um, so contact us, and we will probably take one TA for 877. Um, so there, uh, this TA will help um, maybe a little bit on the projects, but also on the discussions uh, as well, leading some of the discussion as well, and selecting the papers with us. Great. So today, the main lecture is New Research Direction. We'll have six papers presented. Um, and two of each by a TA. So we'll have Soham first, and then Haufei, and then uh, Mehul pre presenting. So the, the notes should be showing. Yeah, just to be sure that they show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, okay, perfect. Great. Right, so the first paper I'll be talking about is multimodal large language model guided image editing. So, when we want to edit these images, when humans, they have some idea about an image, they just give a short and succinct instruction. So for example, if you look at the pizza image on the top left, we want to just say, make it more healthy. That's what we just tell generally. Or if you look at the image at the bottom right, where we'd say, let the laptop have a green web page. The questions that actually arise are, how do we make the pizza healthier? Do we reduce the amount of meat on it or the amount of cheese or for the laptop, do we just put a green screen? So these are how you add details to better guide your image editing. So for example, to make your pizza healthier, you include vegetable toppings. Or to put a green screen on your laptop, it's important to maintain the context that the green web page does have related content as it was in the previous image. So this is the architecture which was described by the authors of this paper. So I'll go over each component of this. So let's focus on the input and output here. Right now we have an input of a cabin inside a forest and we are saying, let, it, let the cabin be present in a desert. So right now, as you can see, there are still details missing from the instruction provided by the human. Hence, there's a need to add or generate more instructions because humans will always just provide short and succinct. It's the job of the MLLM to provide right. details for the same. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. So, that's why the first component of this is that we're using a frozen MLLM to generate more details given the input instruction and the image. So the instruction, as you can see, would be, we add, for example, the sandy terrain and sparse vegetation would create so on and so forth. So these kind of details are generated by a frozen MLLM. And it's important that we provide both the instruction as well as the image input for it to be conditioned on. So once we train this, as you can see, the output of the MLLM is still very long because um, providing such a long uh, input instruction, there are chances that you, the model might not focus on the right aspects. 
Hence, there comes a secondary need to summarize this entire generated text into a more concise version while retaining the information. So therefore, we also use a summarizer. So in the paper, I think they use a flan T5 based summarizer to summarize all the details present in the, to a final form, which says the cabin in a desert is surrounded by sand dunes, some vegetation, and so on. So, but you might be wondering, why do we have a frozen MLLMAO? Because our main goal is not to generate the more not to generate in a cascaded format these instructions. Rather, we want to train the MLLM to generate these succinct yet detailed instructions in one shot. So therefore, we provide this um, input, which is the Cabernet Desert is surrounded by sand dunes. We provide that as input to a final or MLLM, which is essentially the same architecture. But what we're doing instead is that we're training it autoregressively, how you train a normal transformer architecture. So we're providing the input short instruction from the human, which is have them be in the desert and passing it through a trainable parameter embedding layer. We are also providing the input image and we are adding an adapter layer, which is one of the methods to fine tune MLLMs today. So we're passing that again through a trainable adapter layer. And as you can see, we also have provided a, a, the, the rightmost input, which is the beginning of sentence token, the cabin in the dot, 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 and image tokens. So that is essentially to replicate the auto regressive process where the output of the current time step is then fed as input to the next time step. So this is how you train the same MLLM to generate a succinct yet detailed version of the caption. So finally also, right. I would also like to highlight that how, for example, in BERT, there's the, usually the CLS token, which is supposed to capture the meaning of the sentence. We also explicitly provide as input these image tokens, which are meant to capture all the information tied between the input image and the instruction, which is being generated. So we then pass that visual token and we combine, we pass that into the edit head and the edit head is essentially a layer, which will do some transformation upon the image token. And finally, we are passing it to a trainable diffusion model. And as you know, diffusion models are mostly the models which are being used today to transform from an input image to a final output image. Um, right. So moving on to the next paper, I will now be talking about an LLM for, but for speech and text. So Salmon is a paper, which is, or is an architecture, which is introduced to speech, audio and music. And it's, I don't know why, why it's called open neural network, but yeah. Um, so the idea is that you want to integrate a pre-trained text-based LLM with audio-based encoders. However, you might wonder that there are many prior works in this area. For example, speech GPT or audio palm. These are big models, which essentially do the same. So how is Salmon different? So as you may notice that Salmon will have good performance under training tasks like ASR translation, um, audio-based question answering. What's more exciting is that emergent abilities were observed in Salmon when you train it on a large data set. So for example, what are these emergent abilities? These emergent abilities are essentially tasks which are not seen in the training set before. So for example, we have speech translation to unseen languages. That's a new thing that's entirely reliant on the text-based LLM. Then we have spoken query based under question answering. So essentially while the text input might not contain any question is when my speech is being recorded. So the LLM detects that we have a question recorded in the speech and generates an answer for the same. And we also have another, there were two new novel tasks proposed by this paper because these were emergent abilities, which are audio based storytelling, which essentially means that given an audio background and some text generate a story out of the same and speech audio co-reasoning, which means that we have, um, I have asked some question in the speech, but there's also some background events happening. For example, there's a car crash or there's some rock concert going on. So gathering information, both from my speech, as well as the background audio events. So that's called uh, speech audio co-reasoning. So that's why this is exi exciting because of these emergent abilities. And another factor, which is more towards in um, LLMs in general, is that these abilities are activated by tuning the LoRa algorithm, which I'll talk about in detail uh, on how they tuned it. So this is the architecture. So first, as you can see, we have multiple, like three different forms of input. So we have speech and we have music and some audio events. 
So why do we have two separate frozen encoders for the same? So the whisper encoder is a speech-based encoder, which will essentially translate your audio into natural language text of the spoken content. And then we have the beats encoder and the beats encoder essentially encodes um, non-speech content. For example, um, it can be what audio events were present in the background audio or the tonality or what kind of music is playing, so on and so forth. So we then use another uh, layer called the window level queue former. So what that essentially does is that it's a simple transformer layer, but those yellow boxes or the yellow rectangles that you see, they are static query um, query vectors. So how in a transformer, in a traditional transformer architecture, you dynamically generate query vectors based on the basis of the input and the attention weights, sorry, the query weights. Here, we want to provide a fixed number of queries as input. And what that ultimately helps us achieve is that given a variable length of audio input, it will output a fixed number of tokens. So that essentially helps unify our entire architecture and helps the architecture then pack in any sequence or any length of audio input. So that's what's happening here where we are providing the whisper and the beats encoder. We are also provide, passing that as input to the window level queue former. Um, oh, we also have a text instruction prompt. So since it's an LLM, um, we want to be able to determine on the fly that, okay, what information I want out of this input audio. So that can be, okay, answer what's happening in my background, or it could be like, okay, tell me a story on the basis of what's happening. So that's how we provide, that's why we provide the text instruction prompt and we feed that as input to the LLM. Um, right. So as you can see, the LLM is frozen, but there's attached to it, appended to it. There's a LoRa trainable layer. So for those who don't know, I'll briefly describe LoRa where LoRa is a large language models, large language model parameter efficient fine tuning method, which essentially involves attaching low rank embedding matrices to the LLM layer and that's what's trainable. So it's some, somewhat similar to the adapters. So what I'd like to highlight over here is that or before using the LoRa fine tuning trick, um, or more specifically, when the high value, high LoRa scaling values of four we use in each of these graphs, you can observe that the performance for each of these tasks, which is ASR or speech and audio co-reasoning or story telling that's pretty low. So what essentially changed or what the authors experimented with was that they decreased the scaling factor. So when they reduced the scaling from four to three to two, they observed that the emergent abilities of the LLM got activated somehow. Um, so this is an empirical analysis and they haven't really motivated as to why this might be happening, but I found this is an interesting observation. I thought to share this with you all that you can play around with the LoRa scaling factor to maybe try and activate certain abilities in your models. Yep. Um, thank you. Well, before any yeah. questions on those papers. Uh... Oh yeah, sure. Um, yes. So. Emergent ability essentially means is that the model seems to have developed um, certain capabilities on its own without being explicitly trained to do so. So the pre-training task for the Salmon model was just speech recognition and um, phone recognition, which essentially is a similar task where you recognize text from a phone call. Um, so these were the pre-training tasks, but because they were trained on such a large amount of data, um, and when you started play around, playing around with the LoRa scaling factor, it turned out that a certain new abilities, for example, um, spoken query based question answering, where my question is embedded in the audio and not in the input text. So the LLM is able to recognize the meaning of the question from the audio and answer the same. And then we have speech audio co-reasoning and audio based storytelling. So audio based storytelling, storytelling should be easy to understand. Speech audio co-reasoning is important where in addition to understanding the question in the speech, the model is also able to isolate the audio events happening. So for example, if I'm saying call 911 in my speech, and there's also an accident which happened in the background, for example, a car crash or something. So the LLM would generate, okay, the person is calling for 911 because he has been in an accident, so on and so forth. So that's kind of co-reasoning where you take both the modalities, different forms of 
information as input and reasoning about the same. So that's speech audio quality. Does that answer your question? Okay. I mean, it does, but if that's the case, then the human would also understand that he needs to provide more detailed instruction because if it's just, for example, make pizza healthy, like my first thought was, okay, wait, maybe I reduce the amount of cheese or reduce the amount of meat. So of course it's a more interactive process where if you want something, um, you provide more details, but again, I think there's still a risk that, um, it will still hallucinate, even though you've explicitly stated what you want. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, um, the text, the first, so the text prompt is divided into two parts. I didn't include it in the slide for uh, conciseness. Um, uh, but the first part is essentially always the same, which says that, um, uh, imagine you're so-and-so and you're listening to this audio. The second part of the instruction changes that, okay. Um, given this audio, identify what's happening in the background or give, tell me a story on the basis of the input audio. So there are two parts. One's a fixed part, which always remains the same. The second instruction part changes. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So basically, are we? If you want. Yeah. Okay. So I will introduce two more exciting new research directions for my part. And the first direction is called multimodal grounding. And I will introduce a paper called Ferris, Refer and Grounding Anything Anywhere at Any Granularity. And the motivation of this project is to allow the users to point to any points or any segments in the image and ask related questions about this. For example, you can see the questions uh, what what animal in area region one and region one is just a free form referring and generates the model is able to generate the grounded outputs and to tell tell the user that the grounded box is ca called a typical kind of animals and this type of free form input referring is different from the previous grounding box and you can see the image in the right what is the object in region one and what is the object region zero and you can see if we use single grounding box it, the model is not able to precisely de detect what is the knife what is a gun and if we use the free form input referring it can do this so currently other multi-model models has no good abilities to understand free form reference you can see the examples here when we are trying to ask a free form region or small box in the image the ground truth gives a very good explanations, but the lava, the cosmos, and the shikar, and the, a lot of other models cannot understand what is pointing to you. And only the proposed Ferris model can answer correctly. So the basic and the most important question to achieve this is how to design unified representations for three types of regions, which is point, box, and freeform shapes. You can see that when we are trying to point into somewhere in the image, it can be a point, can be a box, and can be a freeform shape. So a thing that called as hybrid region representation is proposed. It is represented by a region name plus and coordinates and plus a feature. So how to get a feature for the freeform referring? It proposed a spatial aware visual samples. It includes sampling, can based uh, filtering and pooling. And th this is one block and multiple blocks is combined together in order to get a region features for this free form region. And since we have solved the hardest problems and we can have a hybrid and unified representations for a free form referring in the image. So uh, when we are trying to train an LM based model to learn from those representations, we use an image encoder to encode whole image and use the spatial aware visual samplers to extract the features of the freeform referring and to put it in a large language models like Vicuna to generate the final answer. So it turns out to be pretty good on multiple benchmarks. Okay, this is the first paper. The second one is called SPAE, Semantic Hybrid Autoencoder for Mod Model Generation with Frozen LMs. So basically, similar with the previous papers, 
it is also trying to utilize the power of frozen ARM to improve the performance of our task. To understand these SPAE papers, we, we, we need to start from another paper called VQVAE. VQVAE is a relatively old DeepMind paper, which is trying to reduce the dimension size and do autographic pixel CN based generation in order to get a better uh, multimodal generation. So th this, this following graph is related to a VQVAE. You can see that it has three parts, an encoder and decoder and a quantizer. The, the existence of quantizer is, is because that it requires it to have a very low dimensional representation, which is discrete and to generate the final output. And it predefines the embedding space of quantizations with size K. And the discrete quantization is the must for pixel CN to generate the final output. So the K size codebook is called a fixed codebook for VQVAE. So basically it's very easy now to understand that SPA just keep the same structure, including an encoder and decoder and a quantizer, but it just replaced the original codebook with the uh, embedding space of K vectors into a, a LM codebook, which, which is a subset of uh, LM vocab representations. So based, based on that, it adds a pyramid encoder structures to allow representing semantic concept with notable fewer tokens to control granularity of the generated image. Quickly on this, maybe oh, yeah. go to every small, uh, no, the 36. Yeah, go to every every little step like sampling. What does it exactly each yeah. of them? That so, will help you. Yeah. So basically you can see this in size. The input is a feature map and mask, and the, there are multiple blocks and the flatten and projection. Our final goal is to get uh, regional features for that free form reference. And for the, each point, we just the first get a lot of points on the free form reference and sampling based on those points and, and get some KM based on previous blocks and the current ones and do a uh, pooling feature, feature pooling things. It's very, like, very similar to the graph neural network kind of things. Yeah. So you, uh, on the left, the input points will be uh, a cloud points in a sense? Yeah. So, okay, yeah. so you have a cloud points on the left. And the sampling is just typical random sampling yeah. for that? Yeah. And then you, the, the KNN, can, can you explain the KNN more specifically? So you just uh, yeah. approximate the value associated with each of the sample. Yeah, so basically, since we are doing sampling and we are trying to ignore some of the points, we just uh, yeah. try to like give it a weighted, uh, weighted neighbors features propagations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Since the motivation proposing this is to get a hybrid region representations, which just unifies what is a point, a box, and the freeform shape. Any other questions? And the pooling is uh, maybe just explaining one last time the pooling, the fusion with neighbor. What anything special there, or just a typical pooling? Uh, it's just typical pooling, I think. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, cool. I'm going to be discussing two more uh, interesting papers that came out uh, actually a few months back. So this is all very cutting edge research. Uh, but we've so far in class talked about a lot about images, text, and audio. Uh, yeah. um, we, oh. we didn't set up this camera. Okay. So so can so. <laughs> yeah, that, that, uh, yeah we, we're using that one. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked a lot about text, image, audio, uh, but a lot of you have also projects in other modalities. And we want to also cover like other modalities as well. So how do we do that? So this is what we're going to discuss today, like generation from some kind of unique modalities and the unique unique modality that we chose was actually uh, EEG signals. So um, we've talked about how good uh, generation techniques have gotten through maybe the use of diffusion models through GANs uh, and other stuff. But what about thoughts? Can we convert 
our thoughts into images and it's actually not that difficult to do that we've seen a few techniques where they put a lot of electrodes on your brain try to get some readings out of you and then generate that into images but these are very invasive techniques and it's not portable you need to go to a special lab they put up a lot of stuff but eeg signals are much easier to read right and it'll be really cool to see how my thoughts can be converted into images of what, what i'm thinking so this is what this paper does dream diffusion uh, but there's a couple of challenges that come through right first of all uh, eeg signals are what they're thinking and if you're a cmu student you're probably thinking a lot of things at the same time so uh, that means the re temporal resolution is a uh, high so it captures a lot of rapid change in your activity uh, brain activity but also uh, it's really hard to localize where this activity is coming from so it doesn't know which part of the brain is actually triggering a lot of time so it's uh, there's a lot of noise right also uh, what happens with eeg data is they're affected by various factors so if i haven't slept a lot it's going to change my data uh my age my cognitive state everything is very dependent and also finally when we're talking about diffusion models and embeddings to convert text to images and all of these we've sort of reached a state where we can talk about their embeddings in a in a sort of similar latent space but eeg data we haven't explored as much so their space differs significantly so we need to actually properly align these modalities together uh so that is what this paper ends up doing so first it addresses the first limitation that we had right which was noise and limited information so what they do is they actually use a very similar transformer based technique they just do mass signal modeling so they take a few a uh, mass eeg uh, they take a eeg signal they remove a lot of the chunks so if you remember the lecture about uh, a uh, lecture about uh, when we were talking about vae and other mass mod mae in techniques they remove a lot of the chunks and they have that reconstructed as you can see it's not very accurate compared to images but that's the point you want to essentially get a very deep understanding about what's happening in your brain so that's the first thing that they do to get a good understanding of the essential eeg data space next they align it so uh previous methods they were fine tuning stable diffusion which is like sort of the state of the art in the open source community for this kind of uh for text to image data but you want to also align the clip supervision which deals with text and images with eeg embeddings so uh so they what they do is actually they can they transform these embeddings in the same dimension as a uh, clip has through a projection layer and then you have a loss to minimize the distance between the eeg embeddings and the image embeddings uh so the this the clip model is frozen through this entire fine tuning process so that way you have first address the limited noise and limited information you've also addressed it not being in the same sort of latent space finally you see some results so if you can see over here the ground truth is what image is sort of shown to the person seeing and this is what the what we imagine the brain uh, puts out so if you can see i'm showing like maybe a camping site so i think about tents if i'm showing a german shepherd i think, sort of think about how a uh, similar kind of dog and as you can see there's a very very significant improvement from previous techniques so uh, before this paper came around there was brain to image and the results look very very bad uh, and now you can see so the same sort of things uh, the results are much better 
and this is sort of like the difference between generations so what you've essentially taken is you probably replaced gan based techniques with diffusion that's partly the reason why these results are so much better uh and so that's it for eeg data but another thing that we want to see is okay we've talked a lot about text we've talked a lot of images what's another modality that will be very very important in the future and we want to move towards embodied uh multimodal models so essentially anything that helps us control actions uh robots uh any any physical embodiment right so uh, what's the motivation for this uh llms have basically conquered yeah uh not images they're basically uh, transformed into like the same um uh, like it's you you're feeding in eeg data as other like eeg data as well it's just transformed in the same latent space so you're creating an embedding which is the same dimension as the image data i will have to check the paper for that but i can share it with you after this so, yeah. any other questions so uh that's a good question and what we sort of see is to some extent yes right so uh again it's very noisy data so you can't really say okay this is the exact image someone thought of but if you look over here the ground truth and the sample generated they're very very similar so there is some amount of uh leeway that you see here when it comes to okay if i'm seeing a particular image i'm thinking about a particular image now what what's annoying here and what i think you're getting at is what's the validity of this it's are like sure i can have a human say i was thinking about this but were they right and also all of these they all of this data is highly dependent on stable diffusion as a whole so uh, actually evaluation becomes a very big concern in this kind of research which they actually address in the paper so yeah uh, there's a lot of stuff to be done in this particular area that's why it's exciting oh the ground truth is just the image that a person showed so uh you are shown this uh german shepherd so the thing is you're shown the german shepherd then the image is generated from this technique given your eeg data eeg data also show something like that so that's how you say that okay they were thinking that oh uh you need uh that's a good question actually uh so i think what's important here is that eeg2 image is so what are you doing right you're try essentially getting eeg2 image mm -hmm. but most of these techniques recently that have picked up steam have best results when there's a textual component to it because you're describing the exact features that you want so essentially what you're end up, end up using is stable diffusion so this project is built on top of stable diffusion as opposed to uh just creating a completely new model out of nowhere because the uh clip uh embeddings the uh lie on 5b the data set for text to image it's very very robust mm -hmm. so that's a good question like can we just remove the text component and have it be good but that's where most of the data set is describing each and every feature so uh it's sort of like the same dependence that we have on imagenet and recently we've been moving away from that by just having self supervised methods so you can actually probably think about a line of research where you just remove the textual component and have it directly generated but right now it offers a very robust description uh i'll have to check on that i don't know yet uh i think the input given to it is just the eeg data okay so yeah, yeah. oh so we have to transform the eeg to a text box yeah so you're not even like technically you're doing eeg to text but like it's all in the same latent space so like you're not even actually directly converting it to text so yeah so the the key insight is you're using stable diffusion you're converting eeg into sort of what clip thinks a uh, normal text slash image embeddings are and that's how you're creating the one to one comparison yeah cool uh awesome so uh embodied right 
so it's very similar uh, in terms of what we're doing, except we're not talking about generation now. We're talking about LLMs. So, uh, yeah, if we're talking about real world applications, sooner or later, you have to ha consider a lot of more modalities that come from sensors. And LLMs, as good as they are, lack any of these direct connections to the real world. So, like, if, if you just use chat GPT to actually do say any kind of real world data, it just assumes something exists. It's not really that great at it. Um, and there have been a few methods that came out in a few year, a uh, few years past that use robotic policies. So, like, essentially assume there's a robot and you give in some instructions, but they're also very limited because you can only provide them text input. That's like a limitation of LLMs. But recently, uh, as Sohan was also mentioning, like a lot of multimodal LLMs are coming through. So how about we try to create one that is very much for embodied uh, ML. And uh, another thing that they show, if you read the, through the paper, is that the recent simple visual language models uh, don't do well with robotic reasoning. So it, it's not just, okay, I've suddenly put in images, so it'll perform better. You need to actually think about it from an embodied perspective. So what do I essentially do? So I take Palm, which is a great, uh, uh, great language model, and I inject uh, continuous embodied observations into Palm's language embedding space. And uh, so, yeah. I encode multimodal observations into vectors matching the language token dimensions. So some very similar thing to what we do with the EG data. And the analogy is it's essentially instead of inserting language tokens, I've in, in, uh, introduced embodied continuous data. And uh, if you can see over here, it's given question mark embeddings what we're inserting. We already have images through some VIT kind of structure and then you also have the question which is just text and you get uh, the large language model that is palm as the back end and you are generating some output and hopefully that output will now be used to control something in the real world okay so what modalities are we incorporating into palmy turns out a lot of them so first and foremost let's get through the simple ones right we want 2D image fe features. We just use vision transformers there. Uh, you want to have simple inputs and outputs about uh, object states, uh, like reinforcement learning sort of techniques of, hey, these objects exist, state estimation vectors. You also want some kind of representation of those particular objects, which don't have pre-structured entities associated with it, like something new. So uh, you basically end up using VIT to encode some kind of uh, structure encoder for visual input lacking those pre-structured entities. And then uh, this is cool, like object scene representation transformer is also used. So that's an alternative to the ground truth segmentation. So like rather than relying on external knowledge about objects, they're discovered in an unsupervised way uh, through this transformer. And uh, entity referrals are essential for any planning sort of tasks. So these are multimodal tokens for object identification. So essentially enables this kind of model to reference objects using some specialized tokens. And most of these modalities are actually mapped into the language embedding space through as simple as an MLP. So you have these nice, uh, nice models, and then you just use an ML, MLP in the uh, end to convert them into the language embedding space. Now there's more talk whether, about how, impo how important is that? Maybe you can go to a, uh, do you need to convert it to language? Maybe there's an, in, I mean, language embedding space, maybe there's an inherent uh, representation before that, that's probably better. Those are all good research topics to think about. But uh, once you have that, right, once you have encoded all these new modalities into this question mark that you see here, you also want to think about how you interpret the outputs. 
so some output uh, so it's a decoder only llm right so it just generates text completion in the end but we need to distinguish between tasks that require text only output so maybe some kind of description based on uh, some embodied task like okay which object is this red uh, robot arm holding up so that's a text output you don't particularly move on beyond that but how about what action should this red robot arm take now that it is holding something so you want to distinguish between these two tasks and uh, for this they have very baseline studies done right now so they only uh, do it for low level skills for a very limited vocabulary uh, if you can see over here uh, you start go to the drawers open the top drawers take the rice chips out of the drawers so this is the sort of low level stuff that i'm talking about so very limited vocabulary explains what it has to do and that's pretty much it uh in terms of results it is very good on a lot of interesting things that most llms sort of fail at uh so it can do ocr free reasoning which is very cool so that's uh that's probably due to vit um it's good at uh, q and a uh where you have visual inputs but also you've tokenized that so it's better but importantly you want to get robot initiative so given image q uh, given image if a robot wanted to be useful here what steps would it take so it has that sort of understanding of some kind of embodied agent actually working around these tasks <laughs> and that's pretty much it thank you so much uh, i'm happy to take any more questions so um yeah so uh, if you can see if you see through these questions uh the <laughs> given image so uh look at zero shot multi image reasoning so where is image 1 in this scene image 2 is in this scene image 2 is text so you're essentially saying um uh, i have text image other modality tokenized uh, autonomous something and what some kind of question based on that which is just text answer is just a generated box so you could uh uh, so like you could hack it to give it a bunch of questions answer between these questions but that's how you hack an llm uh so they've been using mostly nlp based uh, evaluation metrics so they've actually found out that it uh, performed very um, there are a lot of data sets that have come up recently so this pami model performed the best when it came to robotic reasoning uh, as compared to the previous visual llm models Um, okay, and I will do my best to give you, we have four more papers uh, that are for the other two TAs. I will do my best to give you a glimpse of them. I will also invite you, we'll share the list of those 10 papers. Uh, they are not reading assignment, but that's what, in fact, the full list is uh, not just 10. I think we had about 30 papers. So we'll share all of them uh, just for you. This is our... Uh, in a sense, a preview to the advanced 877, that's us sharing these papers. Um, the the first one, you remember, we talk about module networks. I, I said module networks are fashion again, and that's true. There, there, there were, I think people, uh, there's at least two teams working on Web Arena and other things like this. And, and one of the core components is that planner, often large language models are now used as that planner that decides different subtasks. And so this visual programming is embracing the fact that originally module networks were offered as an initial step saying, hey, if I have a hard task to solve, maybe I should uh, split it into subtasks, submodules. And in this case, the visual programming is literally taking a large language model as my main planner. Um, so if it, you take it here as an example, uh, I'm not used to have to stay in front of the camera. So 
Um, but in, in this case, what you will have is given a, an instruction and it's a multimodal, although you could imagine the version of that that's unimodal. I think there was some prior work. And then what are the subtasks that someone could do to address that? And uh, I think the main novelty here is trying to be as zero shot or little training as possible, like take advantage of these existing ones. Um, so um, I, I, I would just um, give it, but the main, main thing was the advantage neural, uh, neural module network went through many iterations. So right now, they talk only about the original neural module networks. As you remember, we went to neurosymbolic and all of these. So, so to say, hey, we're better than neural module network. Yes, you're better, but there's been to get to where the visual programming is. There's been a lot of great step, and I think so. I invite all of you to see this as a nice family of papers, but they really do a lot of different tasks some module added to this. Um, in this case, if I remember correctly, um, it's a preset set of modules. So uh, we're a little bit closer to the module network in that sense. They're predefined, but they're predefined mostly as verb in the language model. They're like, so if, if someone could, could they add probably easily to that. Um, and they do try across many, many different tasks. So, so this paper is a nice little, um, for people maybe in web arena or other, well, even a lot of your tasks on reasoning, winnow ground, all of this, this may be a paper to look at. Um, the other one is, um, I, 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 I often give my own opinion on these papers. So this one is, um, um, the idea, um, uh, I don't know, for me, it uh, has a flavor of dropout in a sense, or drop modality. It's like you, you have uh, or a series of experts. One is vision only, one is language only, and in vision language. And, and there you're going to train by forcing, one, by allowing one of the other. You're like uh, dropping uh, uh, experts uh, to force it, uh, to, to allow... In a sense, you would like to get the most of the vision only, the most of the language only, and when needed, you have vision language, but you would like each of the individual one to be able to um, to learn as much. What does it mean? It means that if you were to train only the vision language, and we know that language is very strong. These days, language models, I have to say, they're it's a kind of um, I'm recorded. Okay, but yeah, they're the... Uh, but they're kind of the winner right now. Uh, but 10 years ago, uh, ImageNet and all this, computer vision was the winner at that point. And so uh, uh, let's see what happens in the near future. But at this point, language is strong. If you put both of them, with 1030, don't remember. Um, if you put both of them in a visual language model, uh, you may end up overwhelming one by the other. Language may be taking most of it. So the dropping here, I think, allow the vision to still be um, still be strong. I think that's my intuition into that. The second thing they do uh, is they call mask then predict, and 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 I will show it visually in in a second. But uh, typical. Uh, M MLM kind of um, mask uh, language model where you mask and you're trying to predict the token, very self-supervised learning. Here, they're embracing the supervised learning. They're embracing the downstream tasks. They want to be as good as they can on those downstream tasks. Now, if you want to be as good as you can on the downstream tasks, should you predict the token you mask? No, you should predict your downstream task. So when they say predict, they mean really predict the downstream task. Um, the next slide I just realized is uh, has some issues with uh, uh, scaling. Let me see if I can scale it again. Um, yeah. Oh, I definitely don't need this. Um, yeah. Great. Um, oh, I hope I didn't screw the... Oh, sorry. Uh, I need to check the Zoom to be sure that um, whoever is online is not going to suddenly have no more recording of this, of the screen. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, great. 
Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. I just wanted to be sure that the recording of the screen is not on. But yeah, um, in fact, uh, maybe we don't uh, the, go in the, the, the figure itself. But the, the, the core idea is that by having this, um, uh, in a sense, uh, the choice, they, they call it multi-way. Like you could train just the vision, you could train through just the language or you train through both, or you could see it as a drop modality kind of thing almost <clears throat> because the the language only uh, vision only or both. Uh, by doing that, you're allowing your language only to be as good as it can, the vision to be as good as it can, and eventually the two together. Uh, and the second is that you do mask. But then instead of predicting the mask, you're doing the downstream task. So then you're going to be much stronger at the task. And then they do this beautiful, cool graph that says, hey, we're better than everyone else in purple. Um, and not surprising because they're, they, they, they train for these tasks. So, uh, but it's still good. It shows that there was a, a lot to be gained by training in a very supervised way. So here's a really nice uh, uh, kind of approach to that. So so that's the second one. So the take homes, uh, visual programming, you want to think about it as kind of the next to next, next generation to module network. Here, two take homes, um, sometimes language can overwhelm or if you do visual language. So there is something interesting with the multitasking. And if you know that you're going to do downstream tasks, then that's uh, important. Um, this the next. Uh, there's two more papers. Uh, I will give the high levels. I, I not as much in details in as the TAs that really look in details on all of those papers. But I want to give you a high level of these papers. This one was also very interesting, very different from the other papers. We on purpose. We had all these like 30 plus papers. We kind of selected papers that were very different. You, uh, there's a lot of other papers that were really good. We didn't select just because they overwhelm. Uh, overwhelm. They overlap. But they are, this this is uh, data is king kind of uh, take home. If you have good quality data, you will have good quality model, and and that's this whole struggle these days with um, companies who are bringing very nice models, and at the same time we don't know what was the data that was used to train them, and that's a very big challenge. And then they, I think the open source community and the academic community have been very proactive and we're seeing very good large language model that's getting close to other like more commercial oriented or closer uh, source. And, and, and CLIP in multimodal, I mean, you can't teach CLIP a uh, multimodal without talking about CLIP. It has been very impactful. Uh, we know it's looking at, at this mutual information between language and vision. So, so the algorithm looks, I mean, once you know the details, relatively simple, we've, we've looked at it, you could probably train. What was really interesting is the same model trained on, on raw data and a lot of raw data or on 400 um, uh, million, uh, I, I think it's data, but uh, I think in this case, it, it's still multimodal, but it, 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 it's the raw. And then they themselves took the time to uh, uh, really carefully uh, uh, clean the data. And I'm not going to go in all of the step, but they, they, one of them was balancing the data. So was very key into that balancing the data. So uh, I, I believe it's like topic and attributes, but like like the balance of like really important uh, to that in, in, in a sense, it's not too surprising, uh, like long tail distribution, we have this issue. So you bring the long tail a little bit closer, then you uh, a little bit higher, then you get better. Um, so most of that paper is really about, they must have taken every word of the clip paper and look it with a magnifier and like look at every little details of it and they took as much like it's it, it, when you think about distillation of knowledge uh in this case they went from very little and literally the paper has like okay 
Now, what do they mean by 500 queries? And then they tell about it, they test a lot of things. Um, so a lot of the paper is about taking almost this one or two paragraphs where they talk about the data processing in SLIP and magnify it and really think, because I mean, at the same time, companies, yes, they, they create that, but they, they must have been, uh, 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 they must have intuitions from what existed as a way of processing data. So um, so they are like, okay, most of the paper does this, it's probably what they meant. And so that's kind of the mapping they're doing. Um, so one is about your tokenization. They spend a lot of time on the tokenization and building this uh, entry level, the substring. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go in all of the details, but they, they very carefully uh, because there is effectively a, a table in the paper. So they're like, oh, uh, we're gonna go uh, into each of them. I, I don't I don't wanna go in all of these details, but at the end of the day, I think what was really nice is to see this difference. So this is clip performance. Uh, and there's another one as well. And they managed to be uh, as good, if not better. And now this data set, if I understood correctly, is open source. So that you can get and all the data that's related to that as well. And the last one, uh, a nice paper that says, hey, um, taking uh, this large VLM model, visual language model, and take this large vision language model and use it to help and, and kind of transfer that knowledge into uh, you could say uh, a, a, a text to image uh, generator. So you have a lot of information in a that has been learned in a more um, self-supervised way where you have uh, vision and language uh, learned together often through some masking uh, and we saw many of those models. So this is what you have here. And then you want to transfer that uh, into now suddenly you have an image to, to graphics or to uh, image, sorry, text to image generation. Um, the, 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 the main uh, challenge in this case is a lot of these uh, vision to language and then you want to transfer that to image to, to uh, a text to image is is primarily all about transferring the alignment of the space. So you, one was learned in a certain space, it has certain data, certain domain, you want to transfer it. And the, the, the key novelty of it is that, that aligner in there. So um, I will not go in all the details uh, in this, but the, 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 the main novelty is that they were trying back and forth, going from a more clip embedding to their, uh, uh, which is, uh, primarily the text version of the clip embedding and trying to move that knowledge now so that they can do text to image and they uh, do it in an iterative way. And their results are really impressive. Um, um, I like uh, I like how they also take some uh, AI famous people uh, there, but they're trying to um, make it. Um, and so we've seen this, this one, uh, I mean, it's really interesting, but we, as we've seen, I think this is like the, there's a lot of those like image generation and text generation. So I think this one is interesting, but don't put as much weight. But I really like the other three papers that I mentioned. I think these are really uh, places to look at. So um, great. Thank you all for your attention. And um, a few things uh, since we have a few more minutes, I'm going to stay here uh, if you have more questions on your project. Uh, Paul is also available uh, this week. The TAs uh, are here. And so um, we're there to help you for your course project. This is, should be your focus. Like we on purpose had the last reading assignment uh, this week, no more next week. And like moving forward, you focus on this. You should plan to be there for the poster presentations. Um, we each, uh, even if you're not presenting, you will be asked to attend three posters and give feedback. Um, and there will also be best paper, best poster presentation, uh, which will give you one extra day for your, uh, we're going to do a quick turnaround. So, you know, that you have one extra day for your final report. So nice poster give you, 
Uh, and we are planning to open this also to general public. So this presentation should not, the poster should not be, oh, they've already seen the midterm. We're going to build the poster for now. No, this is a brand new poster. Uh, be as visual as possible. Be multimodal uh, as possible, not just language. Um, it's hard to put acoustic and brain uh, in this, but at least be as multimodal as possible. Thank you very much and uh, talk to you all soon. Yeah, thanks.